So I'd like to introduce uh, Christine Taylor. So excited, it's like <laughs> so the heart yeah. orange. I have that picture. Exciting right? yeah. or jealous? I do. Maybe the maybe the car was jealous. <laughs> no, it's on, celebrating. 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 on January twelfth, in 1987, Margaret wrote, I remember those early years of our marriage as such a special time together when we got to know each other and ourselves, so that when December in 1972 brought news that our firstborn was on the way, we were as ready as we would ever be. Of course, I was excited about this new life growing in me, and it meant so much to share it with you and see that you were really excited too. It meant a lot to me when I was in labor to have you there beside me, helping to keep me calm in a tough time. And what a help you were with little Randy. We were always equal co-parents, and our children have benefited so much by it. Yeah. <clears throat> During Randy's toddler years, Margaret wrote a letter to a babysitter um, with instructions. <laughs> as soon as he wakes up from his nap, he has lunch. Put a bib on him, put him in his high chair, give him his bowl and spoon, and he will feed himself. Don't give him milk because he's off milk right now. Give him lemonade or funny face drink. <laughs> she is Real so controlled. <laughs> <laughs> ah. ah. <laughs> Give me a break. She's <laughs> getting started. Too. Just chill. <laughs> he can handle his own cup too, but be careful because when he's done eating, he often lets me know by throwing everything on the floor. <laughs> he still does that. <laughs> but we keep the doors to the bathroom, den, and our bedroom closed at all times because he can get into things and cause quite a mess. Mm -hmm. He loves to play with the books in the den, but that's a no. <laughs> um, on Saturday, June 30th, 1983, Margaret wrote, nine years ago, actually this must be July 30th, nine yeah. years ago tonight, I was in St. Jude in hard labor thinking that giving birth was no fun at all. <laughs> now I have three great sons. Randy is nine tomorrow and we will be having a picnic. He is so tall and handsome. Aww. It's hard to believe he has grown so fast. When I think of Randy, the word that comes to mind is charm. Mm -hmm. He really knows how to get along with people. Aww. That is true today. <laughs> <laughs> he is warm, sensitive, and loves conversation. He is athletic and has good coordination. He loves riding his bike and wants a 10 speed, but borrows mine for now. I think he will be a leader since he is so comfortable with people and definitely has a mind of his own about most things. <laughs> At nine. Yeah. At Very nine. true. Mm -hmm. My prayer for Randy is that he learns not to always try for the easy way, but would instead stick with things even when they are hard. I did that. You did that. I started a company. Yeah. <laughs> it's still going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Today. Doing well. <laughs> also that he would learn to stand up to peer pressure from the older boys. I'm thankful that he has a kind heart and cares for others so much. And during Randy's preteen years, Margaret wrote on October 30th, 1985, <laughs> Randy continues to improve at school. He got a 95% on his history test today and turned in a mystery story that I have found very good. His teacher is very tough, but it seems to bring out the best in Randy. 
What was your quote, Margaret, about Randy? That oh, it's from Tom Sawyer. Uh -huh. May grow up to be president someday. They don't hang him first. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the director, but I, <laughs> I was a counselor in training. I was like in early leadership, and the rule was that I was not allowed to date anybody in the group. So for five years, we were friends before we started dating. And she fell in love with you when you had nothing. <laughs> not two nickels are rubbed together, so and I if know you had, she really loved you. And if you had two nickels tomorrow, she'd still love you. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Yes. That's true. <laughs> well, we started. We were friends for five years, and we started dating. Uh, what three? No, three. Yeah, three weeks before I started my first company, mm -hmm. and then I was working eighty plus hours a week on a oh regular basis. And, uh, she really had to love me <laughs> to go through starting the business. Oh, I, I have to add a one story of how headstrong you were. <laughs> and our, oh, yeah. um, we had our babysitting you and your brother Matthew. And we got away for the weekend. It was around Christmas time, and so they had one of those boxes of chocolate covered cherries. And Dave and I are sitting in the living room watching TV, and we hear this crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. You know how that paper, paper is like, yeah. crinkle. We walk in the kitchen, and you and Matthew are on the floor, stuffing them in. And when we said, Hey, what are you doing? You stuffed them in the basket. And we're just chasing like a little chipmunk. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm already caught, so yeah. the more yeah. you get yeah. in, they're probably not coming back out. I got you up, and I didn't hit you hard, but I gave you a little pop on the butt, just go oh. up, and took you in your room and explained why this was wrong. You did not talk to me for a good month. Oh. <laughs> oh. It was kind of like, well, yeah. not talking. Okay. Okay. There you go. But, yeah. you, you were mad oh. at Carol. Oh. We're okay now. Yeah. <laughs> So Randy and I have three children. Ethan Michael Christian Taylor, who was born on February 8, 2009, and then our twins, Melody Joy Taylor and Gabriel Aaron Taylor, who were born July 1, 2012. Yes. And Randy, your mom, and I had to go shopping for high school graduation the day before graduation. Because we didn't know if you, if you were going to graduate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to wait until all the finals you guys were have in. So and little faith. And <laughs> I figured they graduated you because none of the teachers wanted you back. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't That's just get, right. get them out. That's not true. <laughs> Now I wanted to add one little thing about Margaret, just from the point of view of Randy's uh -oh. wife. Now, if there were any dirt on Margaret, or if Randy didn't like Margaret, I would be the person to know. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say that in all the years that we've been together, I don't think I've ever heard Randy utter one negative oh. word about his mother. I had nothing. <laughs> he only, <laughs> he only has praise for her. Oh. Has fond memories oh. and. And praise, and so um, I hope to be in in that position later in my life. So. Don't worry, Margaret. I'm coming up soon. <laughs> <laughs>
Math part. Yes. Yeah. Matthew Arthur was born October 7th, 1974 in Gunner. And uh, again, with the advice to babysitters, here's a hero. Some days with Matt are better than others. So if he cries every time you put him down, don't worry. It's normal. Of course, when he cries, you'll want to hold and comfort him, but not to the point where Randy is ignored. Ooh. So if Matt has been up for a few hours and Randy needs attention, put Matt to bed, close the door, turn on the radio or TV, then let Matt cry a little. And don't feel guilty about it. It won't hurt him. Sometimes a buggy ride will relax him, and Randy likes to take walks up and down the street. <laughs> and this is a something that my mom wrote to my dad. It doesn't say when, so maybe we'll find out. Yeah, there's no date on it. So. Okay. Dear Chris, I took your advice and went to bed after your call, in brackets, from your motel. I was all relaxed and on my way to sleep when I heard Matthew tossing and turning and finally crying. I knew he had been grouchy all day and a little feverish this evening. I thought it was tea, so I took him into the kitchen to give him an aspirin. He was sitting on the sink over the dishwasher, and all of a sudden he began throwing up all over. I was in too much shock to think of holding him over the sink <laughs> until it was too late. So the poor baby was soaked and started shaking from cold. I changed him right away, his diapers were full too, and took him into our bed with the electric blanket. He was so sweet and smiled and giggled at me. He probably felt much better getting all of it. I guess so. Finally, I put him back to bed and went back to the kitchen to repair the damage. I had to wash the counter, dishwasher, and floor. Matt, Matthew is not back to sleep, and I'm afraid to go back to sleep until I'm sure he's all right. I'm afraid he has stomach flu and may be coming down, and I. I may be coming down with it too. So if you hear me calling for help during the night, you know I really need it. My poor little Matthew, he was sick and I just thought he was being spoiled. Yeah, I didn't put it in there, but he, besides the counter and the dish, it was all over me. Oh. But I took care of him first. What color was it? <laughs> Pew. And then, and, then, and, then I, and then I had a change. And, I was like, this Fortunately, I was out of town. And you were out of town. <laughs> not what I imagined mother had to be. <laughs> this is a, a letter that she wrote to her mother-in-law, Charlene. I have laughingly told others a story about your advice regarding not force feeding or forcing reading on children too young. Enrichment activities are great, but they really gain nothing by being early readers. And I re really agree. Or, I, I really agree with you and tried to follow your advice. So one day at your house, when Oriel and Matthew picked up a book and started reading aloud, I saw the amazed look on your face. I didn't teach him. I don't know how he learned to read. You wrote, you wrote this to Grandma Taylor, right? But it wasn't my fault. I told you. Yeah, but at first when we started reading, she just looked shocked. And she looked at him, she looked at me. Yeah, what did you do with my grandson? <laughs> um, but it shows that I did listen to your advice about raising children, and I always wanted your good opinions of me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Mother appreciation homework given to Matthew by Chris. Homework assignment. You wake up in the morning and you find yourself sitting in the sand on the green planet side of So this is dad writing to Matt. Yeah, yeah that, that, sometimes the kids would take mom for granted, so I always give them exercise to show how they appreciated them. Okay. Yeah. You, br you brush the sleep out of your eyes and look around only to find your mother lying next to you. Suddenly a shiny blue creature walks up to you and your mother announces, in a minute, uh, Matthew, he knows your name. You will be sent back to your bedroom on Earth. Your mother is not needed on Earth, so we will keep her here on Sirius. Uh, you 
and you pull out a letter from your pocket that explains why your mom is so important. It's a long letter, a page and a half. <laughs> and it takes the wow. creature from two years a long time to read it. What did the letter say? Matthew wrote, Dear creature, my mom is too important. You have no right to pull my mother off earth. She takes care of me, she gives me money for school, she reads me stories, she fixes my lunch for me, she does lots of other things for me too. Lots of people need her, need her here on earth. The kids at my club need her, she is the director of my club. Chris, you know what club? You know what club? <laughs> it was uh, Alana, it was a Sparky. Oh, okay. The rest of my family needs her. There are so many people who need her. She is too nice to me. People would cry for weeks. Please let her stay. Sign Matthew. <laughs> well, okay, said the creature, and sent her back to Earth. The end. <laughs> All right, uh, and then this was written in uh, July 7, 1982. It's uh, Mario writing. I'm reading the Chronicles of Narnia to Matthew and having a great time. He loves just... Uh, he loves reading just like me. He is quick and has a sense of humor and is really a great kid. I love to say silly things to him just so I can hear him say, Mom, <laughs> in that slightly disgusting voice. <clears throat> when I think how great all three boys are, it makes me sorry for the time that I am impatient with them. Like today when I almost ran over Tim Big Wheel. <laughs> I need to have an uh, audio track here from Matthew. <coughs> Happy birthday, Mom. When trying to decide what to get you for this special day, we thought that what you've been missing most is the chance to hold your five grandchildren, whom you haven't seen in over two years. While these videos could never take the place of seeing the kids in person, we hope they made your day just a little bit brighter. Just four more months until we return. It might sound trite or cliche to say, she was a good mom. But in your case, it's true. You were, and you are. As a child, I took it for granted, not really knowing how lucky I was. In a world of broken homes and neglected children, I had a mom who loved me a ton and cared for us day in and day out, faithfully serving her family. Our home was a happy, warm, and safe place. I think it really hit me after Christy and I had welcomed our first child, Caitlin, into our world. In so many ways, she was a delight to us. But the other side of the coin, the sleepless nights, the diaper blowouts, the teething, the sicknesses, our loss of personal freedom, and the awesome responsibility of caring for such a small, fragile life. It was challenging, to say the least. I remember thinking, my parents did this four times. <laughs> it blew me away. Me too. That's when I realized that a good parent isn't just a given. It's the product of choices made day after day, year after year, one choice at a time. It's the result of a mother deciding to deny herself and her own desires, to sacrifice and work and invest in a child and in a family. You were that kind of mother. And when I had my own child, I truly realized it for the first time. I remember growing up, our house became the de facto gathering place for the kids of the neighborhood. Our house was seemingly always full of children, full of life. Kids gravitated to our place. At the time, it just seemed normal to me, the inevitability of the way things were. But now looking back, I know that our home had that kind of atmosphere, that kind of attraction, because you made it that way. Kids just felt welcome at our house. I had a friend growing up whose house I never entered, not even once in my life. He said I wasn't allowed. To this day, I still don't know why. But our house, what a contrast. Our house was a place full of life and laughter and fun. You were the mom I could always talk to, whatever I was going through. You've always had a good listening ear. You wouldn't dismiss my concerns or overanalyze things. You always managed to find the balance between a healthy dose of comfort and the right measure of good advice. And I'd always leave feeling like things weren't so bad after all. For the first 12 years of your motherhood, you were the only female 
in a house full of rough and tumble boys. But instead of feeling sorry for yourself, you rose to the challenge. Nothing captures that better than camping on the side of the road at Cajon Pass, a place with no amenities, not even a toilet. When Christy and I had been married for about a year, we were driving near Cajon, and I said, let's stop and see the place where we always camped when I was a kid. When we got there, Christy was shocked. To tell the truth, I was shocked myself. <laughs> like that, all while caring for three small children. But you, you were that tough, that intrepid. You would have made a good pioneer woman. And I have so many special childhood memories of that place, which wouldn't have happened if you had said no. There was a framed sign hanging in your house in Marina. Maybe you have it in San Clemente too. It said, Dull women have immaculate houses. I always like that sign. I think it encapsulates the way you approach life. While it's true that our house wasn't always the tightest, the flip side of that was that you were certainly not a dull woman. You were always seizing opportunities to get involved in plays, at church, at school, in the community, always using your God-given talents, always serving and blessing others. And isn't that what life is all about? I don't think anyone has ever looked back from their deathbed and wished they had scrubbed more pots and swept more floors. <laughs> I always thought it was cool to have a mom who was so involved. And even with all that you did outside the home, you somehow managed to keep it all in balance so that we never felt neglected at home. You told me once that, in some ways, you had a hard childhood. Your home wasn't always the place it should have been. At some point, you decided that when you started your own family, you would strive to create a home that was in many ways the opposite of your own home growing up. Parents pass on a lot to their children, and it can be hard to break out of established patterns. Kids often grow up to be just like their parents in many ways. So statistically, I think the odds were against you, but you overcame the odds, and by the grace of God, succeeded in establishing and nurturing a healthy, happy home. I remember you telling me that when you were a young teen, your parents wouldn't drive you to school or church events or to friends' houses. It was hard on you, and you determined to never be that kind of parent. If I could add up the number of miles you've driven us, your kids, to school, for there were no school buses at CBCS, to work, to youth group, to friends' houses, the total would be astronomical, and the number of hours you sacrificed to do so would be no small figure either. Those hours and miles were a measure of your devotion. Wherever we were, when the school day, church service, social event was over, we didn't have to wonder. We knew you'd be coming. We knew you'd always be there for us. And you always were. You always are. I love you, Mom. Happy birthday. I wonder if he's for hire for speed writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a great kid. Nice. Oh, I talk about a finicky eater. Yeah. yeah. And now he has kids that are finicky eaters, so there is justice. Yeah. There's always justice. Yes. There's always justice. Yes. Yes. Memory about Cajon Pass. We had the same thing. I took Deverly. We were coming on the way back from Vegas, and we stopped by there, and I had the exact same thought. Like, and I came back. I think I even asked my dad. I said, "What are you thinking?" I mean, like, <laughs> like. But we I, didn't have the money to do anything. No, no, yeah. We had fun. We had a blast. But it, yes. I think around that time, I think there may have been a murder near there, and so it was in the news. So I was like. <laughs> You know, it was different times, but that was my friend Rose at the moment, and you know, he said that he had thought of that and uh, had a plan, and uh, yeah. 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 I don't know if it would have started all the time. Right? <laughs> That's true. We didn't have money to fly to Hawaii, so we had to make our 
home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have them. Yeah. And yeah. they remember that bonding. Yeah, it, was, it was awesome. But I did the same thing. I took this team. I was like, this is where we camped. It was awesome. She's like, and where did you go to that? In that little crevice up there. Like, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> we just looked out for the rattlesnakes. And it's <laughs> yeah. You do what you can do. So uh, Matthew went, went, later went on and was married August 21st, 1999 to Christy Marie Nielsen. Uh, where they both met at Biola University. And they have children, Caitlin, Nathan, Justin, Julianne, and Elijah. Whew. Wow. As Matthew's mother-in-law said, they live in the jungle. There's not much to do there. <laughs> they, well, they went. They went one past you. They had five. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you counted for two, though. <laughs> no. Me? Yeah. Especially in the teenage years. We teased Randy, but he was a great kid. He was. <laughs> Still not a great. That's how you said to me. <laughs> well, when he was 16, I was, you know, looking for a hitman, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I grew up. Is that really? Oh, All right, you gotta do a baby pass off here. A baby yeah, pass off? Oh, my goodness. A baby pass off. Hi. She lives with me, I'm a girl. <laughs> Um, I'd say the biggest impact Margaret has had on my life is uh, raising Tim. She raised this adorable little boy into a wonderful, loving, caring man, husband, father today. And that's a huge, huge impact on my life. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, Tim was born May 30th, 1978, in Long Beach. He was 9 pounds, 7 ounces, 21 inches long, a little bit bigger than my <laughs> um, a journal entry that Margaret wrote when Tim was about five years old. Uh, she said, Dear Lord, it is apt that I read of your creation in Genesis 1 and 2, for I am watching one of your better creations right now playing at a San Clemente Park. Timmy has tan pants which are ripped in the crotch. His light blue t-shirt with the Santa Fe engine on the front hangs out below his navy blue sweatshirt. Hooked to the back is a bright red cake with a Superman logo on the back. Aww. Topping the whole thing is his, is his green and yellow cap from Grandma Taylor's school. Every time he runs by, it makes me laugh. JJ also had a blue shirt, bright green shorts, and cowboy boots. Those are friends that he plays. Yeah, that's um, So Tim went to um, CBCS, Capital Valley Christian School, um, through fifth grade. Um, Margaret homeschooled him for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and then in high school, he went to CBCS for a year and a half, and then they moved up to Monterey, and he attended Monte Vista Christian School um, sophomore year, half of sophomore year, junior, senior year, and that is where we met. We met um, our junior year of high school. Um, we had a couple classes together, but we also rode the same bus, and he would play his guitar on the bus. And that's just what yeah, I noticed about an easy way first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was glad. I was amazed. Three chords, all you need. I was amazingly shy and introverted, so a mutual friend of mine, I told her that I was, I thought it was cute, was interested in him, and she worked her magic and um, got us together. <laughs> Um, that was in 1995. Um, he didn't tell his parents right away that we were dating. He just kind of wanted to see what was happening. You know, just didn't know if it was going to be long. He was going to youth group, and he was showering and putting cologne. <laughs> right away and but um, he did tell Randy because he wanted to talk to someone about it and so at some point I don't know how long it was into we were dating Margaret calls up Randy and says so how do you like to have a new girlfriend and Randy goes oh you know I do know I do know Say I'm dating someone, or did they just kind of no, well, know? Or there was something 
I don't know how it worked, but some ultimatum for my birthday, which was in May, yeah. saying that they had to meet you or something. So right. we went to <laughs> Bubba Gump Bubba trip yeah. down in Monterey, and that's oh, when yeah. I first met you. Yeah. 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 My birthday. Yeah. So you can only call those trips December. once, Mom. I learned. <laughs> in May that I came to his house and met his parents and I remember driving down the house. It was a good half hour from where I lived in our school. I remember thinking he drives this way every day for school. It's a mm -hmm. really long way. Um, so yeah, then we got married in 1999 and it was four years to the day from when we started dating. Um, we stayed at Chris and Margaret's house after our honeymoon for about two weeks or so, just until because our lease on our apartment started in January. We got married December 11th, so we had to go somewhere for the rest of December. That we didn't know if Y2K room. would end the it was world. Also Y2K. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait this out. Yeah. <laughs> it's safer with mom. Yeah. 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 So we were there, then we came down here. I finished school. Um, then. Several years later, uh, our kids came out. James was born in 2009, Jonathan in 2011, and little Andrew just five months ago, um, last August. Um, so. Well, he he was getting his degree. He wasn't gonna make a fuss about it. But then he he changed his mind. And he told all of us to come down for a graduation party. <laughs> right. And right, that right. was. So he could announce that you were pregnant. Yes, yes. Which was a real shock. He was finishing his bachelor's degree and just kind of wanted to be done and just move on. And then we realized the timing for when we found out I was pregnant and when he was graduating. And he's like, oh, okay, so I guess I actually have to go to the graduation then. And okay, we'll have a party, I'll do the graduation. So we had a big graduation party. And oh, by the way, we're also pregnant. <laughs> and that was with James, um, 2008. So. Um, I have the privilege of being married to Margaret's third son, and we now have three boys. And um, I know how much I know how much hard work and energy it is to raise three boys, and I'm only five months in. <laughs> <laughs> very, very yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, I'm very, very thankful for all the years of work and energy that Margaret put into raising her three kids, especially yeah. my husband. <laughs> had a huge impact on my life. Yay. I wanted to share something along so the theme of my segment. And, and it's just a lot I can share and memories and, and fond things. Um, and I, I know we didn't have all night because I knew everything else we had. But I kind of sum it up in, in three things. Um, and one is this loving. Um, Loving in so many different ways, but the one that came to mind is kind of funny. Is when we are getting Randy and I, and all the boys, you know, the ice cream truck comes around, you're out there. <laughs> and so I don't know about, I don't know why, but I was one of the first in there. I got my sugar daddy, and I'm hanging out. He the sugar daddy. Randy, Randy got his stuff. And all the rest of the, the neighborhood boys were getting their thing. They were standing out by the end of the back of the truck. And this bumper is huge. This big bumper. It's not like a bench. And so we were sitting on it. And then Randy said, well, it would be great. You sit on the bumper. It will go up the hill really slow. And when I give you the signal. Tim, I said I was sorry. <laughs> Show that love. Get, you know, give you the signal. You just jump off, and it'd be great. And you run down the hill, and, and I never gave you the signal. <laughs> you never agreed on a signal. Details. <laughs> well, it must have been. It was later in the day. It must have been his last route. He was done for the day. <laughs> so as soon as he got done with all the kids, he booked it up the hill. So, 30. Oh, wow. 30, 40 miles per hour. Yeah, something yeah. like that. And he gets towards the top of the hill. Randy, freaking out, says, don't jump off. <laughs> <laughs> There's the signal. That's the signal. <laughs> I jump off. Oh. So, so I, you trusted me, and so oh. 
Oh, you're going 30, 40 miles per hour or whatever it was. That was the and signal. And you see your big brother give the signal and you're like, this okay. doesn't seem right, but okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I got quite a scrape on my leg and I had a kind of a, an amnesia. I didn't remember. I remember the signal and the jumping thought. <laughs> the next thing I remember, I was in the bathtub and her mother was, you know, tending to my wounds. <laughs> and there's a lot of a lot of cases like that. That's probably one of the more humorous ones, but just that that selfless love and doing what needed to be done to to, to have it be done, you know. That probably looked my leg looked like hamburger meat, but yeah. it had to be, you know, had to be done. And uh, you know, when I kind of came out of my amnesic fog, just thinking, where was I? I'm in this bathtub, and my mother's there. Okay, everything's okay. And my mother was there and showing me love. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that uh, I, I recall is just I um. One of the reasons I homeschooled is in my elementary years, I I got this lie stuck in my head and I wasn't very, I, I couldn't do math and I just, I got that stuff in my head. And my parents took me to, uh, you know, counseling and this and that and trying to figure out, you know, and it turned out that all the tests showed I was actually pretty bright. Um, and it was just a self-esteem thing. Um, so my mother, you know, uh, took me into homeschooling, and I, and I remember this, and it, it's, you know, you, sometimes you come up at it's hard times, and you kind of have that voice in your head, and the voice that comes to my head is, is because it probably happened more than once, <laughs> is when I was working on some homework, I'd get frustrated, and I'd say, I can't do this, and she would say, yes, you can do this, you're, you're believing this lie, you can do this, you just need to decide to do it. Uh, and so, you know, when I come across hard times, that's the thought. I say, no, I can do this, just keep pushing forward. And so the, the second thing would be this, that encouragement, and just that how encouraging she has been in, in all areas, and, and um, even, even when it's hard, encouraging me to, to push forward and to, to take on the hard challenges. Um, and the last thing, especially in, in my teenage years, I, I remember, remember fondly was, uh, we would have, we, we were both night out, and so we'd stay up and talk a lot. And there would be things that we'd be dealing with, and uh, sometimes, she, I remember these times, and I still use this advice, that sometimes it looks really bad, and it's like, you just need to go to bed, things will look better in the morning. Yeah. And there are times when I, I get to that point, and I say, yep, that's, that's it. <laughs> um, but just how good of a listener um, she was. Uh, great advice, but also just a really good listener, helping me to think through things verbally and kind of just get, get through them. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the, the greatest thing that is encompassing all three of those things <laughs> is just being a role model for me to, to find a wife who does those three things herself, mm -hmm. who's loving, encouraging and a listener um, that really does all of those and, and I think you know I, I maybe not consciously but sought after that in a woman based on the example that you gave me and Deverly definitely is that um, Deverly will attest that for a date night the best date night I can think of is just talking with her and I think some of that is just stemming from those long discussions that we would have and uh Really appreciate it a lot. And so, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm to do Becky, and for those of you that I haven't met, the reason I'm here and I'm a part of this family is because Tim is my uh, godson. Yay. So, I've been a member of this family now for 36 years. Yep. <laughs> I can't believe it. And I've got to tell you one thing about Tim. <laughs> Talking about listening. Margaret and I would do things together and we'd be in the front seat, one of us driving and then the other one in the front seat. Tim would be in the back seat there, quiet, not saying a word. We'd be talking and he'd be listening. Because oh, yeah. all of a sudden, out of the blue, would come this profound wisdom. Yeah. And Margaret would say, 
where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he'd just be sitting back there, but he'd be taking it all in, what we were talking about. And just, wow, where did that come from? But, Bethany, I get to do this little girl. Bethany, of course, was born in Busan City, Korea, on December 21st, 1985. But she was five months old when she came on Korean Air. And I remember when we got to the airport, we saw a Korean Air plane come in, and we wondered, oh my goodness. Yeah. At the airport. Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. Airport. oh my goodness. Perfect timing. Mm -hmm. And we wondered, is that the plane she's on? And it was. But it seemed like an eternity. And of course, it took an eternity for all the paperwork you guys had to do. Now, I remember doing the notarizations, but they wouldn't yeah. accept it because um, even though she came, I think, before my license gave up, you know, they didn't know how long the paperwork would yeah. be in limbo. So they had to get it re notarized. But there she is. Cute. Cute little gal. But now, those of you that remember being there, we got the pretty ones anyway. Yeah. Um, remember the other little girl? This is what Matthew said at the top of his lungs. I'm glad we got the cute one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that little girl you know, turned into be a child. Yes, yes. <laughs> she was like a monkey in the Yeah, she was. <laughs> so she came on May 17, 1986. Yeah, she was five months old. And there was. There was one lady from Holt, or the two ladies from Holt? You were two. Two? You yes. had, had the child. Mm -hmm. And Mark wouldn't let lose her once she got no. it. Of course, she had been through all this training of how to get a child, an adopted child, to bond to you. She, she stayed home and... I mean, wouldn't let anybody hold her. Well, you supposed to. She gave up so much to mm -hmm. go through the bond with Bethany. But I was so afraid that Bethany would turn out to be a tomboy. Because she had three older brothers, one up and tumble. But this old girl was so girly and prissy. Mm -hmm. She loved, you know, frilly dresses. Mm -hmm. She followed Margaret around and wanted to do what Mom did. And this girl was, is brilliant. Oh, out of her class and everything. It, it was just amazing. And then all the, I don't know how many things she was involved in it when she did her uh, master's degree. I can't even tell you what, what she got her degrees in. But green and coastal ecology. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Something to do with the ocean, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, I think she, I, I, I had driven myself up to the airport, but I think you said she cried all the way home, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, There were three things I thought, what if this child doesn't smell good? Because there were people that came from Korea that yeah. ate a lot of garlic and parents said, oh, uh, what if she, her cry is irritating? And what was the other thing? And what if she's not very pretty? She was pretty, her cry was low and melodious, and she smelled wonderful. Aww. It was my daughter. And evidently over there when she was very young, they had her swaddled or something. Yes. Because remember she would sit it's in her little thing, never move. You didn't have to strap her in. The doctor said, we, we needed to work her muscles because they were weak because she'd been swallowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a five-month-old, even yeah. older, and she just would sit in her little chair. Mm -hmm. it, it was just amazing. And I feel badly that um, you guys moved away. I didn't get to spend as much time with her as I did with the boys. We were always going places together, and I didn't get to do that with Bethany. But uh, it turned into a beautiful girl, a very smart young lady. You should also know that Marion paid for oh, she the expenses for Bethany to come over from Korea. Oh, uh, we, we, we had the money, but it was like tied up. It was yeah. going to take a while. To, and so she wrote us a check so we could get it right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the first time that Margaret helped Bethany, she said she felt the same way, the same love as she felt when she held her three sons that they didn't do. Wow. You know what that is, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. She, I didn't see her handle Bethany any different than she did the three boys. Just a beautiful relationship. You put her in dresses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dresses. That was the dresses, yes. Yeah.